we, we started last week in this book of First John, and um, I, I only had two weeks, and I've been trying to, to bring together the meaning of the book, the, enough of the content, uh, text of the book, so that the meaning will start to become clear to us. Um, it's a book that I think um, has traditionally brought out some um, erroneous narratives about, um, uh, about God, about the faith, about Christianity. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I want to read to you one verse uh, from chapter 2. We're going to be preaching from chapter 4, uh, beginning at verse number 15, 15 through the end of the chapter. But um, in light of the passage that Dexter just read, um, and, and let me remind you, the, the Dex, in, in the passage Dexter just read, <clears throat> John says to the audience that he is writing to that this is the commandment. When he says this is the commandment, he does not clearly then have every commandment of Scripture in mind. He doesn't even have in mind the Ten Commandments. When he's writing, he, he has a particular issue that is happening to that community of believers, and he has in mind a particular set of commandments when he says to them, if you keep my commandments. He's going to say... Um, these are the commandments, Dexter read it, that you believe in the Son and that you love one another. Now, listen, th those words came out of his mouth. The writer wrote what commandments he has in view. So that when you get to verses like chapter 2, verse number 3, um, I, I kind of pulled a fast one on the folks who are putting up the slides. I apologize to you. I didn't tell you we were going to read this. Um, but when you get to chapter 2, verse number 3, and you see a verse like this that says, By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. When you get to a verse like that and you are absent of the context of the book, what it sounds like is now he is suggesting that unless you become a commandment keeper, you can't say you know God. And because you are absent of the context, then so somebody can drop any commandment on you and say, if you're not keeping it, you don't know him. And then it puts us back on that works hamster wheel, doesn't it? Puts us back on that performance wheel. And every now and then, if we're just honest with ourselves, it begins to prick our conscience when we fail. Um, no matter what culture you live in, it, wherever you find yourself in the world, the culture that you are living in is going to always be at odds with the scriptures and the way of life as a believer. Did y'all know that? There are no Christian cultures on planet Earth. Did y'all hear me say that? There are no Christian cultures on planet Earth. There's only the church where you're going to find the way of life for the believer. Outside of the church, it's the world. And that is, that is also true in America. Presently, America values hard work, don't we? Americans value hard work, don't we? It is a cultural value to work hard. The, 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 the story goes, if you come to America and you work hard, you can succeed no matter who you are. And it is a high value. And that high value has begun to bleed into the church in America, and we're finding it very, very hard to, to somehow live as a Christian in this culture 
and know how to rightly place this hard work value into our faith because the reality is in the church, you don't gain any ground by hard work. <laughs> now that, that one, you know, because of our cultural value, that's, that strikes your ears a little oddly, doesn't it? Sounds strange to our hearing, doesn't it? But the, the, the reality is in the church, We've already tried that. The history of the faith has already proven that does not work. You can be a successful American with that value, but you cannot be a successful Christian. It does not work. So I, I want to I turn your attention to a passage of Scripture. And here's, here's my goal. I, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm being subversive. I, I do have an, I have an agenda. What, what, I, what I really want to do is to get y'all to trust Jesus more and stop working so hard and failing. I want to get y'all to trust Jesus more, stop working so hard and failing at it because, watch this, it's affecting your relationships with other people. Did y'all hear me? It's affecting your relationship not just with God but with other people. We can't get along because we're working so hard to try to please God. That, that sounds strange to our ears too, doesn't it? Let, let me say that again just so y'all can hear. We, we, are, we are failing in our relationships with other people. We can't get along. We can't love each other because we're working so hard to please an insatiable God. A God whose right and wrong is just too big for us. And so I'm in 1 John chapter 4. And I'm going to begin at verse number 15. Now, we saw this last week, right? The, the book of 1 John is set into a particular context. Do you all remember from last week? What's going on? What's the situation in their lives that's causing uh, John to have to write to this community of believers? Do you all remember it's, it's important to understanding the context. Do y'all remember? If y'all remember, nod at me. Say, say I remember. Um, if, if you don't remember, and it's all right, because I know my memory is bad. It's, it's bad. If I don't write it down, I'm not going to remember. If you don't remember, uh, shake your head at me. <laughs> all right. That's called honesty. I love that. Um, so here was the situation was that there were a group of people within the community of faith who over a doctrinal dispute about Jesus have left the community of faith. It was a significant enough of them to have caused an upheaval within that local community of believers. We saw that also in chapter two. John writes to those who did not leave. Right. And he tells them that you are right because of the message about Jesus, who you heard it from. You heard it from us, the apostles, those who actually knew Jesus. Y'all are right. They're wrong. And then he tells them they left from us because they were never of us. If they believed what they left about while they were here, they were never of us. If, because if they were of us, they'd still be with us. They would have stayed. Are y'all with me? That's the, that's the situation. And so John is writing to them. And watch this. The, the passage that Dexter read, John has then two commandments in view because those two commandments are central to the response to those who have left. And that is who Jesus is, the son of God and love for each other, because if they loved you, they wouldn't have left you. Are y'all with me? That's why he has those two commandments in view. So when we get to John, first John, chapter four, beginning at verse number 15, there's really three things in the passage that I want you to see. And hopefully um, we're going to we're going to have to go a little bit deeper here. But um, but but it is that's where the growth in the grace and knowledge of the son happens. That, that's where it happens. Um, another, th this is an aside, why is, why is this Frankie? Th th there's another thing that y'all have to understand about the culture. The culture values pragmatism. 
don't we? Just tell me how it works. Tell me what to do. Right? Yeah, we, we don't, don't, don't spend a whole lot of time talking to me about theory. Tell me what to do. Give me the practical. It's bled into the church, too, because now the church is all, all we're looking for is an application. Just tell me what to do, preacher. Right? But, but listen, it doesn't work that way with God. Right? God has already done everything. He don't need you to do anything. He needs you to believe in what he's done. OK, so um, what we're going to see today, you're probably not going to take any steps home to make you better. But what I hope you take home is a deeper knowledge of the son that will then transform you internally. Are you all with me? That's, that's where we're going. Three things I think that John is going to say, they, they sort of fall into a, a, a three point structure. Right. So I'm, I'm right in line with with regular preaching, three points and then a poem. <laughs> well, this? Uh, three things. Here's the structure. Uh, look at it with me. It'll help you follow along with me. Uh, verse number is, is for, from verse 15 and 16. That's where I'm going to get the first point from. And then 17 and 18 is where the second point is going to come from. And then 19, 20 and 21 is the third. I said third and put up four fingers. This third. <laughs> Yo, everybody with me then, right? Three of them. Um, and, and here's the first thing that John, I think, is going to say in verse 15 and 16 is that the sonship of Jesus is the expression of God's love for us. The sonship of Jesus is the expression of God's love for us. Now, you, you, you got you to you gotta dig in a little bit here with me so that you can see this. Because it comes across, when you first read it, it sounds a little shotgun. It sounds a little scattered. It doesn't, always, it doesn't seem to fit together very well. It almost feels like John is just saying a whole bunch of disconnected things that don't quite go together. But if we look a little bit closer, it goes very well together if you know how an apostle thinks. L listen to what he says. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him. I'm sorry, God abides in him. You'll hear, you'll hear what he said, right? If you confess that Jesus is the son of God, then God abides in you. And then he says, and he in God. I, I love that, right? He, he's nesting this abiding, right? Uh, you abide in him and he abides in you. Now, I don't know how that works, but it works. Uh, I'm in him and he's in me. It's a way of saying y'all are intimately connected, right? The nesting of the abiding is a metaphorical way of saying y'all are really becoming one, you and God. It's an expression of the intimacy of the relationship that you have with God. Don't think it's technical, right? Because technically that's going to fall apart, right? You can't put something in something and then have that same thing be in the other. It's not technical. It's metaphorical. It's communicating the depth of the relationship that you acquire with God when you confess that Jesus is the son of God. Now, you're going to see this because this becomes important. Right. Your your relationship and the depth of your relationship has nothing to do with what you do. It has everything to do with whether or not Jesus is the son of God and you recognize it. Yeah. 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 Are you all with me? Yeah. See, when you say see, the confession is not simply Jesus is the son for, for the first century believer. The confession is what you have come to understand and hold and adhere to and have made known what you understand and adhere to. When you publicly adhere to that, Jesus is the son. Watch this. John says, then you are then God abides in you and you abide in him. Y'all's relationship is solid. No room for doubting, no need for doubting. It's based on your understanding of who Jesus is, and he is the son of God. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now he, he's just getting started, though. And then watch this, beginning at verse uh, 16, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. Yeah. 
Now, that sounds like a change in direction, doesn't it? From their confession to what we have, what we know and what we believe. Here's what I believe the connection is. The connection, I think, is between Jesus as the son of God and the love which God has for us. The, here, here's what here's what I think John is communicating, because I think the, the, the apostles know this, that God sending Jesus, his own son, is an expression of the father's love for us. It was essentially a love act for us that he sent his son. Are, are y'all with me? Now, not just that he sent somebody, but it was who he sent. It was his son that he sent. Right. And if I can recognize and confess that the one who God sent to me is his own son, understanding what it would cost the son in coming, then I recognize then God must really love me. And my confession of that then causes my intimate and deep relationship with the God who sent him. And watch this. In, in just two verses, John has summed up the nature of the gospel. He has just he has just put it so succinctly and powerfully. Listen, we could not mind the depths of those two statements for a long time. We just don't have time to do it. But 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 make sure that you, you, you understand the coming of the Lord Jesus is God's ultimate and grand expression of his love for us. And so John says we have come to know and have believed that love. And, it, we, and you can tell we have come to know it and believe it because we confess that Jesus is his son. And that, and that confession, that understanding, that, re, that realization that has gripped us, and he's talking to those who have stayed, he says that causes us to have that deep abiding relationship with God. Me and him and him in me. So, so make sure you all understand this. Um, your, your relationship with God is not performance based. It's based on the recognition of God's expression of love in the sending of his son for you. We, we're always, we're, you know, um, George, it bothers me so bad. We're always looking for these blessings from God. We're always asking. We're asking for more from him. And watch this, and our love for him is waning when we don't get what we ask for, when God is saying, I've already given you my best. Yeah. 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 Listen, I emptied the bank when I gave you Jesus. Yeah. 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 I am, I, I, that is the great, listen, if that doesn't say I love you, listen, the new car is just not going to get it. You know, that job you've been praying for. Listen, if Jesus doesn't solidify my love for you, you're going to get to that job and not like me any better. Yeah. Yeah. And watch this. People, people are struggling with this all over the country. They're, they're struggling with it all over the world. They're praying for certain things and, and some things they really deeply need. Lord, I'm praying that my mother's health does not fail. Lord, I'm praying for my child who's out there in the world. Lord, I'm praying for my relative who has cancer and all of those things. And watch this. And, and the reality is sometimes God does not give us what we're asking for. Am I right? And, and listen, and it, here's how it, it normally happens. They say, and if you do this for me, Lord, I will do, I will perform. And even in our asking, we know we don't always measure up. And so we're saying, I know I haven't always been, Lord, but I will become and I will do if you will. And then he doesn't. And we say, well, he doesn't because I, I don't perform well enough. He doesn't love me like that. And John is saying, but I sent Jesus. I sent my son. And, and I can imagine John has all of these memories in his head as he writes it, as he remembers the work of the son yeah. for us. 
I, I, can't Im I can't imagine John remembers what it must have looked like in the eyes of Jesus when all of the disciples left him. When he hung there for them. And he watched it and he heard Jesus say, Father, why have you forsaken me? And he watched it and he said, and, watched it, and God himself let his son die for you. An expression of his love for you. And, and, and John then knew also when he saw the resurrected Christ that now sin and death is gone for us. And John must have understood, it, became, it started to become real to him when John understood, then now I have a place in the kingdom that no matter what I do, I cannot lose. And his love for God is blossoming now. It's growing. He watched Peter fall and fumble and, and mess up and say all kinds of ridiculous things. And then he heard Jesus say, feed my sheep now. And now it's just, all, it's all different. It is, it is, we, we say that, listen, we don't know unconditional apart from Jesus. We say unconditional, Mary Jane, but we don't mean unconditional. Listen, Jesus said, confession of me, my love is unconditionally then extended to you. You don't have to perform for me. I watched you try that already. So Jesus, the sonship of Jesus is the expression of God's love for us. And John says we have come to know it and we have believed it. T talking to those who stayed. So here, here's the second thing he's going to say. Then Jesus is the perfected love of God with us. He goes even further. It's not, you know, if we didn't have such a skewed view of love, he wouldn't have had to have added perfected love. It would have just been love. But because he knows we, we live, uh, they live, we live in this less than ideal love culture, right, where love is kind of measured. You know, he loves better than she does. He has to qualify then the love that Jesus is for us. And he says he is the perfected love. Watch this. This is verse 18. I'm sorry, verse 17. By this, love is perfected with us. Now, what is the by this? By what? Y'all look back. Don't look at me. Look back down at your scripture and, and think about it for just a minute. He, he said, now, he has just said that if we confess this Lord Jesus, uh, if we confess the sonship of the Lord Jesus, God abides in us and we abide in him. And he says, and we've come to know that this is the expression of God's love for us. We know it and we believe it. And then he says, by this, love is perfected with us. What is the by this? Now, now she says, I'm telling you, tell, tell me your name, sister, because that's a great answer. Becky, Becky says, it is the confession, because the confession is driving this whole section of Scripture. When I confess it, that's, that's when the abiding happens, right? That's when the relationship deepens. And then so then he says, and by this, by the confession of this and the deepened relationship that is established, then love is perfected with us. Not only did we have, we gain an abiding relationship, but we gained a perfected love. That, you know what that suggests? It, it suggests there's nothing left to be added. It was perfect. That, that love did it all. You're starting to see the sense of the word. He says, by this, love is perfected with us so that, and this is where it becomes good. See, with the so that he connects, he connects it by reason. He connects it by reason to the judgment of God. Be because watch this. That's what hinders our love for God. 
and also is what messes up our relationships with each other. Listen to what he says. So that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Now, now, what does, now what does it mean? Wait, wait, wait a minute. I don't, I don't, I don't follow. Here, here's what he just said. When I confess that Jesus is the son, a deep and abiding relationship now is established between me and God. And he says, and by that abiding relationship through the confession of what I've come to know about the sonship of Jesus, love then is perfected in me so that I don't fear any judgment from God. <laughs> I, I'm not worried about whether or not I perform well or not. That now, by Jesus' sacrifice, has settled and clinched my future with God forever. Boy, that's some good stuff, man. That, that says there is no loss of salvation. There is no God is angry with me. There is no we are out of fellowship. That is, there is no he has wrinkled his brow at what he saw me do in Jesus Christ. The love then is perfected and you don't have to worry about any judgment from God coming towards you. Boy, that's a sermon that, that church folk are, are afraid to preach today. And I said, no, don't tell them that, boy. They, they, they are never going to work hard to be better if you tell them that. They, they're going to they're say, no, I don't, I'm not sure I want you to tell my children that. They're, they're going to be lazy. Listen, they're not going to be lazy. They're going to be free. Watch this, because where he's going, he's going to suggest when they can do that, when they can rest in Jesus, not work in Jesus, when they can rest in Jesus, their guilty conscience about not living up is going to get wiped clean. Right, says, and now they can love somebody else. But he's also said a very subtle but important thing that I want you to realize. Your conscience always gets you in trouble with everybody else. Your guilty conscience. It gets you in trouble with your relationships with other people. He, he says, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. When I understand that Jesus is the son, no more judgment from God. Wiped clean. No wrath coming. Listen, if you sin and God gets mad at you, then Jesus hadn't paid it all. Make sense? Listen, if he gets mad and then says, I'm not answering his prayer, mm -mm, not after what he did. And he has not paid it all. Can y'all see that in here? Watch this. And he says, because as he is, so also we are in this world. We're becoming just like him. Now, not because we're working at it, but because he promised to conform us to the image of his son. Yeah. Did y'all know that? He said, I will conform them to the image of my son. Listen, y'all rest. You're going to get there. Yeah. So, for some of us kicking and screaming, but we're going to get there. It's, it's his promise, and because he's faithful, I will be conformed to the image of God's son. Now, every time I preach this, Bob, somebody always says, then, then you're just saying, I don't have to do nothing. I mean, I, I'll, just, I'll just stand here and wait till Jesus conforms me. No, what you have to do is the hard work of remaining faithful to believing he's going to. And believe me, that's harder than the work of performing. The reason we perform, because that's easier. That's just easier. Listen, when those adverse times come and, 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 and they come to us all, when things like cancer happen in your family and the death of somebody surprises you that you love, it comes back right away, maybe I didn't do something. And at that moment, God is saying, trust Jesus. You didn't do anything. I'm not punishing you. This is not about whether or not you have performed well or not. 
in the midst of the pandemic when you lose your job. Most people are then going to question, well, I know I hadn't been going to church as much as I used to. But, but this passage is saying, no, 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 don't doubt him. Don't doubt in the dark what I told you in the light. My perfect love has been extended to you. That's the hard work. But, but, but watch this. He then says, there is no fear in love. Now, watch this, Bible study. Y'all look at the passage. Fear of what? It's judgment, right? It's right there in the context. Did did y'all see it? They, They cannot live together. There is no fear of judgment in the love of God. Did y'all see it? If you are afraid of him, if you are afraid of what he is going to do, no love. You have not been perfected by it yet. You, you then don't quite believe what Jesus has come for. It, it, it's an indication that your confession is flawed. Y- y'all see it? Don't go back to work, go back to faith. Listen, if you think God is angry with you and you are somehow afraid, don't go back to trying to perform to please him. Go back to your confession. What you have come to know, what you have believed. And he said, there is no fear in love, but perfect love, and is his perfect love, not yours, cast out fear. Because fear involves punishment, <laughs> doesn't it? It doesn't. You know that because you know if you know there, um, there are always these church folks. Um, Frankie, they they just they annoy me so bad. They're always they're always trying to get Christians to act right, pointing their finger, throwing out commandments, saying the Bible says. You had better. The Bible says you had better. And and, and, and watch this. Missing the point altogether that the Bible is not there to instruct me. It's there to introduce me to somebody. And they're always saying you had better. There is a commandment that says you had better. And always behind you had better is, is an Because if you don't, (laughs) there's a punishment coming, isn't it? There's a a consequence for everything you do. Now, that one sounds familiar, doesn't it? Hopefully, hopefully I'll I'll, I'll just take that one down too for them, coach, right? Here here it is. Well, you know, uh, Jesus forgives, but there's always a consequence for sin. What are they implying? You know, when you do something, God is eventually going to do something. That's the fear of punishment. Listen, if you put your finger in an electrical socket, what's going to happen? Did God shock you? Is that his punishment for you? Listen, if you're speeding and you get a speeding ticket, are you going to really then say, well, you know, the Lord told me to follow the speed limit. I guess he just had to stop me. You know, I'm being being facetious, but we have those real ideologies that come up all the time in real life situations that cause us to doubt the love of God. And he says, listen, if you got some fear of a punishment coming that you're trying to stay in line because you fear the punishment, you have not been perfected in God's love. Because there in, in love and there is no fear in love. God is saying, I don't care what you do, I'm going to love you. Listen, Jesus has paid enough. It doesn't matter then what you do, because whatever you do, he has already been beaten for, and he has satisfied my wrath for you. It's the nature of the word propitiation. He he satisfied it. I don't have any wrath left for you. Listen, that doesn't mean that your sin is cheap because it cost Christ for that. He was beaten for it, 
but you don't have to be. Perfect love casts out all fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears, there it is, I said it, but that's what the word of God says, is not perfected in love. If you're performing out of fear that God is going to do something to you, you have not been perfected in his love. And that says a whole lot then about your confession of who Jesus is and what he came here for. Like Paul told the Galatians, listen, if you got to perform, then Jesus died needlessly. So here's the third thing. The perfected love of God results in a love for our brother. The perfected love of God results in a love for our brother, your brother. Y'all can almost see that's kind of where he had to go, right? If the issue is all of those who left, right, they're, those who they thought were their brothers and sisters in Christ who left, who, who were unloving enough to say, we're going to leave y'all, right? Then that's kind of where he had to go. That's the issue on the table, isn't it? So, so watch what he says. How, this is how he's going to connect what they did to their confession of who Jesus is. He says, verse, nine, verse number 19, we love... Because he first loved us. Now, don't miss that. That's, that's one of those verses. I says, Deborah, I grew up in, in church, and that was, one of those, that's, that was one of those verses I had to memorize as a child. You know, they gave me the verse on a piece of paper, and they said, Rem- memorize the verse. And so I, I knew it. I had no idea what the context was, but I knew the verse. Right? But, but don't, don't miss this. You don't love because you're trying. You don't love because they're lovable. Listen, if I have any love for you, and I do, it's because God loved me first. Listen, he fixed our inability to love by his own perfected love. Wait, wait, y'all, y'all miss. This is, this is just too, this is just too, uh, this is just so heavy. Miosha, this this is how God can then take the credit and the glory for anything I do in relationship because it's not my love. Although I love, I only do it because he loved me first. That's the nature of that because. He instigated in me what he wanted from me. He loved me first, and then I love because he loved me first. And then he says, so if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. That's strong language. You know, my my mama would say he's telling a tale. But it's actually stronger than that. You, you know, I'm sorry, it's the height of offense when you say something and somebody says, you're a liar. <laughs> We're offended by that language, aren't we? You know, it would be better if they said, that's not true. But when they say, you're a liar, that's a character assassination, isn't it? That's exactly how John meant it. John says, if they say they love God and they hate their brother, they got a character issue. They are a liar. <laughs> Y'all see it? Because watch this. Because, because God loved us first with a perfected love in Jesus Christ, you should love each other. You don't ha- listen. If God puts the mechanisms in us in place to love each other, and we don't love, then the problem is not with me, it's with him and his mechanism. And God is saying, there's nothing wrong with my mechanism. If you say there is, you're a liar. Y'all get it? He said, no, 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 I've laid the groundwork for y'all to love each other. Don't put that on me, saying y'all can't love each other. That you are lie if you say you can't love each other. You know, so-and-so is just too bad, God. You know, they just get under my, they get under my skin so bad. I'm sorry, God, I can't love them. 
I got to, I got to stay away from so-and-so. They're just, oh, no. <laughs> God says, no, you're a liar. For the, for the one, watch this, for the one who does not love his brother, watch this, whom he sees, cannot love God whom he has not seen. Now, that's another one of those verses we've heard along, a lot, right? But let me ask y'all, let me ask y'all a question, really important question for the understanding of this text. Why is, having, why is seeing someone important for loving them? Because to me, I, I, I just, my, my thought is, it's easier to love God than to love my brother because I don't see my brother. I mean, I don't see God. I see my brother, and he's, <laughs> ooh. <laughs> but, but, but God just says it the reverse. Y'all caught that, right? He's, God says, listen, if you can't love the one you see, how can you say you love me who you don't see? Yeah. And my thought is, I can love you because I don't see you. <laughs> I see him every day. But God says, no, 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 wait a minute, you missed it. You see him, and you say you love me who you can't see. It's easier to love the one you can see than the one you can't see. That's God's argument. Now, why is that? Why, why would God expect me to love my brother because I can see him easier than I can love God who I cannot see? Why would that be? wonderful. I love it. Because if my confession is true, say with me, if my confession of Jesus, who he is, and what he has done is true, then my brother becomes the visible expression of God's love for me. Listen, that my brother exists says God loved him. I can't see the God, but I can see the manifestation of his love in my brother. That's why he's my brother. Wait a minute. Um, see, God, God, this is so wonderful. God has enough confidence in his work in your brother's life that he expects you to see his love even in your brother. You can't say, oh, Lord, but you don't know my brother. Mm-mm. He is unlovable. And God is saying, but he's your brother. Now, what does that mean? Listen, how were you saved? How are you in my love? Yeah. And, and now we start to, okay, I get it, I understand, I understand. And then God says, and he is your brother. Y'all yeah. getting it? Yeah. He is now the love you can see. Yeah. Listen, you can't see me. You got to believe me. But you can see him. Yeah. And if your confession is true, then now he becomes the visible expression of God's perfected love. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, listen, if God then can love you and you're still a sinner, then what makes you think God does not still love your brother who is a sinner? And if God can love him, um, why can't you? You didn't have to watch your child die for him. <laughs> Listen, you haven't put up with him enough to lose your family for him, your innocent family for him. And God says, I love him enough, and I'm at work in him enough that you ought to see then my love at work in your brother. And watch this. This is how this is how this this is how this works itself out in human life. If God's not going to punish him for what he do, does, if God understands His own plan in redemptive history for the bringing about of our own uh, of every person in the body of Christ to be conformed to the image of His Son by love with no punishment, then why do we think I, He's going? The only way I'm going to get Him to act right towards me is to punish Him. If God's answer is to love Him, then why are you trying to punish Him for what He does? 
Why can't you, why, why, why wouldn't you be like me and love him? And then trust me with him to become what I have said to you I'm making him to be. Why are you trying to rush my sanctification in your brother? Why are you giving your brother an ultimatum to change in a year or are you going to give him the blade when he hadn't set his own timetable for his sanctification? I have. I don't want him fully sanctified in a year. If I wanted him, he would be. And he said, you don't have patience with him because you don't have patience with me. And God says, I don't deal with you that way. I give you grace, grace upon grace. I've lavished you with it. I give you grace because who you're going to become is in my hands anyway. Why would I hold you accountable for the sin you have committed now when I haven't sanctified you yet to the place where you don't commit those sins anymore? Because the moment you stop sinning, it will be because of me. And, 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 and in that way, and in that incredible way, the work of Jesus not only sets my relationship right with an invisible God, it sets my relationship right with my visible brothers and sisters. <clears throat> No performance on my part. No working on my part. Yes, you have to keep the commandments to say you know him. And what are the commandments? Believe in the son. And listen, and then the first one leads to the second one. And love your brother. If you believe in the son, you will love your brother. So that there's no there, there's no there's not even work in loving your brother. You will love because he first loved you. Amen. <clears throat>